My idea is for my son to marry her. Can you have kids? That's why I wasn't keen on him marrying someone older like you, my mother-in-law said with a smile. Beside her sat a younger woman, and my husband, the most important person, remained silent next to her. I'm so tired of dealing with his family. I stormed out in anger, but quickly wished I hadn't and wanted to make things right. I feel really bad about marrying into this family. My name is Olivia, and I'm 38 years old. I met my husband, Sam, who was eight years younger through a friend. I was unsure about dating him because of the age gap, but he said, Age doesn't matter. I love you, Olivia. And we started dating, then got married. About six months into our relationship, he decided it was time for me to meet his parents because we were thinking about getting married. His mom didn't like the idea because of our age difference. She said to Sam in front of me, I thought you'd bring home a young, pretty bride when you talked about introducing the woman you might marry. Oh, dear, Olivia is 38. Sam, I mean no offense, but think about it again. Younger women are better. His dad stepped in and said, If Sam thinks it's right, then it's right, isn't it? Sorry for my wife's rude comments, Olivia. After that, they agreed to our marriage. My father-in-law was someone who would calm down my mother-in-law's mean words, seeming like he didn't like arguments. But after we got married, he often ignored things that were wrong, which was disappointing. Sam's family was famous for owning a lot of land in our small town, and my mother-in-law bragged about it a lot. Even though she wasn't actually related by blood, she married into the family, just like me. This family is wealthy, and Sam, as their favorite, has a charming personality that's almost like a dream. The guy I dated before Sam was really careful with money, which was hard, so I like how Sam is generous and relaxed about it. Even though my mother-in-law reluctantly accepted our marriage after my father-in-law scolded her, she doesn't seem happy about it. She keeps telling me how a good wife should act, which is annoying. She's influential among the local women and is proud of leading the Women's Association and being popular. She insisted I meet the association members on a weekday to make a good impression on them. She introduced me with a proud smile, but some of them whispered, you'll face challenges too? suggesting she wasn't as popular as she claimed. Oh, and I was also advised to have a fertility checkup, she added. I felt a bit uneasy that it was my mother-in-law, not Sam, who suggested it, but I was curious too, so I agreed. The exams weren't pleasant, but I wished there was a way to make them easier. Sitting in that examination chair felt like torture. Despite the discomfort, the results of my checkup were good and I felt relieved when the doctor said, you're healthy. Sam seemed worried, but he relaxed when I told him the news. I shared the results with my mother-in-law, hoping we could now enjoy our marriage without worries. Then she said, great, you've cleared the first hurdle. First hurdle? What does she mean by that? I thought she'd be happier. Was she hoping for a bad result? I was unsure how to react when my mother-in-law made an unexpected suggestion. Once you're married, let's buy a duplex and live together. You'll need to chip in for the down payment and mortgage. You work in administration, right? Your salary might not be high, but you should manage considering your age and experience. I'll cover the rest of the costs for the duplex. I was taken aback by this sudden proposal. I glanced at my husband beside me, but he remained silent. Please help me out. Well, about living together, Sam hasn't mentioned anything to me, I replied. Besides feeling insulted about my job being belittled, I was more concerned about the duplex and living arrangements. You haven't heard? Oh, Sam probably thought it was understood. That's not good. We always planned that when Sam got married, we'd all live together. I felt a shiver run down my spine. Was she implying she influenced Sam into this idea through repetition? Yes, that's what I had in mind, she confirmed. What? I never heard about this. Why are you agreeing so easily? I'm sorry, but I didn't know about this plan, and I can't make a decision without discussing it with Sam. So can we hold off on this for now? With that, I left my in-law's house. Later, when I asked Sam about it, he explained that he had planned to build a duplex on his parents' land after we got married and live with them. I was upset that he hadn't mentioned this to me earlier, but he just said, sorry, I forgot. Looking back, 
I realize I should have reconsidered marrying him. At that time, Sam seemed kind and attractive, and I was worried that at my age, I wouldn't find someone else if I let him go. I regret now that I was charmed by his apology and didn't think more clearly. It seems I got caught up in the idea of marriage and didn't see things clearly. So I ended up agreeing to build the duplex my mother-in-law wanted, and I ended up paying for half of the down payment and mortgage. Six months after we got married, I found out I was pregnant. To be safe, I didn't tell my in-laws until things seemed stable. I was worried something might go wrong. Once everything was okay, I told them the good news. They were thrilled and started talking about baby names right away. They were hoping for a boy, but we didn't know the gender yet, so it's still a surprise. There's some pressure, but it feels good to make them happy. They suggested I quit my job for safety, but since I help out with my family's business, I have a flexible role. I chose to keep working as long as I felt okay. My pregnancy was going well, and I began to feel the baby moving inside me, a moment filled with both mystery and joy. I'm grateful for the experience of being a woman and feeling this happiness. Every time I go for a checkup, my husband Sam and my in-laws eagerly await news of the baby's progress, and I'm excitedly anticipating the birth. I believe having this child will strengthen my relationship with my mother-in-law. One day, amidst what seemed like a bright and ordinary day, I noticed that the baby's movements were becoming weaker. An indescribable anxiety engulfed me and I rushed to the hospital. The doctors delivered devastating news. Something was wrong with the baby. How? Why? I was living my life normally. What had I done wrong? Fears of the unknown gripped me as I was admitted to the hospital immediately. Despite the doctor's efforts, my child's journey ended too soon. Just a few more months and I could have held my baby. Why did it happen so suddenly? It felt like just yesterday when the baby was lively inside me. Was it my fault? As tears streamed down my face, my husband's words cut through the grief. How long will you cry? It's done now, isn't it? Crying won't bring the baby back. Stop crying. I was stunned. What was he saying? Our child had just passed away. Although taken aback by this unfamiliar coldness from Sam, my shattered state of mind left me unable to respond. The day I was discharged from the hospital arrived, but Sam didn't come to pick me up. Putting on a brave face, I reassured the concerned nurses that I'd manage fine on my own. Arriving home in a taxi, I was met by Sam, my mother-in-law, and a stranger. Welcome back. It's unfortunate, isn't it? My mother-in-law said with an odd smile. Yes, I replied, taking a seat on the living room couch as directed. The seating arrangement felt strange with my mother-in-law and the stranger sitting across from me and Sam beside them, showing no signs of comfort or eye contact. Then my mother-in-law spoke up. We've discussed this with Sam. Since you can't have children anymore, we don't need a daughter-in-law who can't provide in here, so we've arranged for this girl to marry Sam. I was stunned by her words. As I struggled to come to terms with the loss of the baby, tears brimmed in my eyes. But I fought back, knowing that giving in to tears would mean admitting defeat. Unable to lift my gaze, I kept my head bowed. Despite my despair, my mother-in-law pressed on mercilessly. Well, if you're suggesting you'll support the family financially instead of having children, we might consider letting you stay. But can you really provide for us if they leave you behind? I was bewildered by their conversation. Instinctively, I looked to my husband for support, but he avoided my eyes. Beside him, a woman who looked triumphant stared back at me. I recognized her as Sam's childhood friend, introduced to me at our wedding. Seeing my husband's reluctance to meet my gaze, I realized he wasn't on my side. A chilling realization washed over me, sharpening my senses. While I was in the hospital, it seems they made their plans. They want to kick me out, the woman who can't have children, and bring in a younger wife to have in here. If I stay, I'll only suffer more. There's nothing for me here anymore. Finally understanding this clearly, I said to Sam, I get it. Let's divorce. Please be happy with your new wife. And so I left the house and went back to my family home. My parents were surprised but welcomed me warmly. 
They knew about my miscarriage and were outraged by the cruelty I faced so soon after leaving the hospital. It was a relief to feel their love after so long, and I ended up crying a lot that day. Exhausted from crying, I fell asleep. But the next day, my mother-in-law and husband, who had treated me so cruelly, showed up at my family home. At first, my mother answered the door, but when she realized who it was, she refused to talk to them. Then they started ringing the doorbell nonstop, shouting, We take back the divorce. Come back now. In truth, my family owns a barbecue restaurant, a well-known spot that serves a globally recognized brand of beer. Many famous people, including celebrities and athletes, dine there. However, my husband's family comes from an old and respected background. They had a negative opinion of my family because of our restaurant business. They held on to old-fashioned beliefs that restaurants were shady and that our family background was lacking. We had invited them to dine with us before the wedding, but they declined, citing concerns about beef and preferring to eat at specific places. During the pre-wedding discussions, they indirectly criticized my family, making remarks like, Oh, you're in the restaurant business, aren't you? That's from your parents' era, isn't it? Oh, I understand. Dealing with beef, huh? Reputable families usually avoid such ventures. It hurt to see my parents, who had worked hard to raise me, being belittled in this way. My parents brushed it off with a chuckle, saying, Some people just think that way. On the day I left after the divorce, my husband and mother-in-law happened to catch a TV feature about our restaurant. Until then, they hadn't shown any interest and had looked down on my family. But when they learned that the restaurant was described as running its own farm, producing top-quality beef, and enjoying immense popularity with meat exported worldwide, their attitude changed. Suddenly, they were panicking and came rushing to me, pleading for my return. They tried to cozy up to me, saying, If we'd known you were so successful, we wouldn't have talked about divorce. We're sorry for yesterday. We weren't thinking straight. Please come back. It made me feel sick to my stomach how quickly they changed their tune. After all the discussions about children and hairs, was it really just about money in the end? My husband, Sam, and his family never bothered to inquire about my job in detail. So I had casually mentioned that I worked in office administration for my family's business, leading them to believe I was a low-paid, unimportant employee. It seems they assumed that if they asked me to contribute to the house's down payment and mortgage, I give up on the marriage. The truth is, I actually oversee the meat export division of my parents' company, earning a substantial income for an office worker. Thankfully, I had saved up a good amount of money due to marrying later in life, which allowed me to meet their financial demands. I'm also a major shareholder in the company and aspire to take over my father's position to further expand the business. They never showed any interest or asked me about this until they saw it on TV, which suddenly changed their attitude towards me. Despite incessantly talking about wanting children, it seems money was their primary concern all along. I'm utterly disappointed by their superficiality. After silently observing the situation, my father finally lost his temper and kicked Sam and his parents out. Thank you, Dad. You saved me. I said gratefully. Still simmering with anger, my father began drinking and cursing at them. He wanted me to explain everything that happened before the marriage, holding nothing back, believing I shouldn't handle this alone. My father immediately contacted a lawyer he knew, seeking damages for my unjust eviction. We also demanded reimbursement for the housing funds I provided during our time living together. The claim was acknowledged, and I was awarded a refund for the expenses I covered. However, Sam alone couldn't repay the loan I had taken out, so they had to sell their family home. Despite being a luxurious house on rural property, it still had a substantial mortgage remaining even after the sale. Moreover, the house was filled with Sam's mother's eccentricities, making finding a buyer willing to accept it as is difficult, which could delay the sale. Luckily, they were able to sell some of their separately owned land, allowing me to recoup my money first, which was a relief. At this point, I was grateful to have married into a landlord's family. Sam and his parents were forced to leave their beloved two-family home and now seemed to be struggling in a rented apartment, trying to repay their loan. 
Oh, and as for the woman who was considering marrying Sam, she was only interested because she thought she'd live in a big house and that his family was wealthy. But as soon as she found out they were going to lose the house and still be in debt, she disappeared. I think it was smart of her to run away because if she had married him, she might have been pressured to have a child and maybe even forced to work because of her young age. This area is still pretty rural, so news spreads quickly. Gossip flies around, especially when it involves a well-known family like Sam's. People are talking, saying things like, they treated her horribly and drove her away. They used to flaunt their big house, but now they're in debt and living in an apartment. Both the wife and the potential new wife have left them. Their family line might end with this generation. It's surprising how accurate the rumors are and makes you wonder who's been watching all this unfold. The power of a rural network is something else. It seems like my controlling mother-in-law, who used to act like she owned the place, is now sneaking around even when she's just out shopping, worried about what people will say. My parents reminded me, we warned you about marrying into a family that would demand pregnancy tests before marriage, didn't we? And brushed off the situation. They tried to console me in their own way, saying, Olivia just rushed into marriage a bit. Don't worry about it. It's okay if you stay home for now. They show their care in their own unique way. Despite the challenges we faced, like being evicted and going to court, I can sense their happiness at having their daughter back home. I'm grateful for their warmth and support. It feels like I've woken up from a bad dream about my married life, and now I'm free. Although I have a divorce behind me, I'm still in my 30s and haven't given up on marriage. Once things settle down, I plan to focus on finding a new partner. But for now, maybe I should dedicate more time to doing good things for my parents.